Disclosure was invited by the Panzer Museum and this video contains product placements. In this video we look at why mine clearing tanks usually don't work, how a German combat engineer fighting in Ukraine ranks various mine clearing equipment for using combat and we also look at various mine clearing alternatives in and outside the museum. We start with an old mine clearing tank that is equipped with an anti-mine flail and then we look into the other systems as well. One thing with these vehicles is, so imagine you have a battlefield and, or before the battlefield you could actually say, you have a front line that is covered with mines and you know, okay, you want to break through the enemy defenses, so you have to go across the minefields. So you bring your mine clearing tanks. So the issue is, as you can see, I mean, it wouldn't be painted white usually, but the dust signature, these things, and the sound signature and everything they bring along is they are just completely visible. And also they are rather slow. So they go about 0.5 kilometers per hour to about six, depending on the source when they're clearing mines. But with this vehicle particularly, which is based on an M48, so this is not the best mine clearing tank that's currently available, but it gives you a general idea. So there are various issues. If something is configured wrong, this vehicle might actually dig in. The driver does not see very well, so it has to be commandeered by radio from outside. Now, so basically you have this very loud, noisy vehicle that splits up all the dust and all the mines and everything it throws up. And this is leading the charge of your tanks or your infantry that follows very slowly behind. So basically you have to establish fire superiority and suppress any enemy weapons that can deal significant damage to this vehicle. Now this is an M48, so it's not particularly strong anyway, but even if you have one on a ba based on a Leopard 2 chassis, it's still a very vulnerable vehicle because it's a sitting duck. I mean, you, you know where it's going if you're the enemy and looking at it, but there's more problems. Now, let's say for somehow, the tank manages to clear a lane through the minefield. You know what the next thing is gonna happen? The guy, the driver, can't get out of the vehicle because the mines might have thrown on the vehicle itself, so it has to be cleared by a special explosive ordnance team to check for any mines. And also, the, the, the area he cleared so some mines might have detonated, some might were thrown away, but in some cases they were just damaged. So for instance, if you have an anti-tank mine, the detonator fuse is still strong enough to hurt or even kill your infantry. So in some cases you have to also clear again the lane that is cleared. And also, the, the, so basically the lane that it clears can also be followed by a tank. So in, let's assume, okay, it manages breakthrough and the enemy now brings in the reinforcements. So when now the tanks start crossing, finally in these lanes or the one lane you have established, they're also sitting ducks. And also the enemy know where the lanes basically more or less are. So you see there's a lot of issues that you have to consider. Because I was like thinking, yeah, when, when I heard, okay, the offensive is stalled due to mines. And I was like, yeah, you have mine clearing tanks. And then I was like, well, Let's think about this. Well, basically, I, in this case, I didn't start to think. I just dropped him a message and asked, what is the problem? And then it was like, oh, that is actually obvious. I should have known this before. And, and it's really like, sometimes we don't think about what are actually the problems because we don't realize, okay, the mine clearing is rather slow and all the other effects. And there are more problems still. But before we look at the other problem, let us first look at the different kinds of mine clearing equipment available and what are their strengths and weaknesses. As such, I asked a German combat engineer for his rating on the different equipment in a combat situation. Now, he particularly noted that depending on the situation, like terrain, this ranking might change. So take it as a general guideline. Now, this list goes from worst to best. As such, at position number 7 are robots. This might be surprising, but the combat engineer's point is simple. Robots are great for single mines or a small amount. 
but in a combat situation for breaching, they simply can't clear enough mines that they can be considered effective. Robots, in his opinion, are best used against individual improvised explosive devices, which often also have a huge payload. On the sixth place are mine rollers. Although this one is highly dependent on the situation and technical implementation. The combat engineer witnessed several vehicles equipped with mine rollers to get lost in Ukraine. He notes that in sand the rollers work well, but on even hard soil the rollers can miss mines, particularly when the rollers are not suspended independently from each other. On the next place are mine flails. As I already discussed heavily in the introduction, they are a mixed bag. In terms of clearing capacity, these are great, but they move very slowly and have a strong dust profile. As such, quite problematic in combat. On the fourth place, we have the combat engineers with their various equipment, except line charges. Combat engineers are reasonable fast and can clear both anti-tank and anti-personal mines. They can approach and work in silence. This is in stark contrast to all the other systems. Of course, they are very susceptible to enemy fire, particularly small arms fire and shrapnel in contrast to mine clearing tanks. On the third place are tanks with mine blows. Now this was quite surprising to me, I thought mine blows would not really work, but if you look at modern solutions, the mine flail is mostly gone, and most modern systems like the US M1150 assault breacher use mine blows. So why do these mine blows work? Well, most new anti-tank mines use shape charge warheads, where a metal jet penetrates the tank as such they are basically directed mines. A mine blow tilts them over and they go off in a direction that does not matter or not at all. Of course there are some with tilt protection, but then the focused charge goes into the air or the plow. Since shape charge jets only make small holes, the plow could care less. The mine plow is generally faster and less visible than a mine flail. Be aware that there are also minor mine blows that are mounted on just in front of the tracks of a tank. These systems are less effective. Something I will discuss later in this video with a museum exhibit. On the second place are infantry carried anti-mine large charge systems like the US anti-personal obstacle breaching system. An explosive line charge system is a system that connects a lot of explosive on a line that is thrown fired on a minefield and then detonated. Ideally, it detonates all the mines buried nearby as well, thus allowing troops and vehicles to cross. Note that the infantry system is not intended to clear anti-tank mines, but it should detonate anti-tank mines as well. To give you some idea about the capabilities, the US system weighs 125 pounds, so about 57 kilogram. It can clear a footpath of 1 by 45 meters. So technically one should be able to use two to clear a path for tanks. But that would require that they are fired perfectly parallel to each other and I doubt they have such a perfect flight path or that they can be lined up that easily. This brings us to the first place, namely vehicle based mine clearing line charges. These have far more power than an infantry based one, as you can imagine. There are various systems like the Russian USAT P77 system that can clear around 90 meters with a width of 6 meters. The British Python Minefield Breaching System or the US M58 Mine Clearing Line Charge. It can clear a lane of 100 meters length and 8 meters wide. The main advantage of this system is that it is fast and powerful, thus ideal to follow up by an assault force. Note that the US M1150 Assault Breacher Vehicle that is based on the M1 Abrams chassis comes with two of the M58 line charges and is also equipped with a mine plow. So this system is currently one of the best suited vehicles. Speaking of the first place, currently I have a limited time offer of my cat person t-shirts, particularly one with the Leopard 2A4 and other German tanks. If you are not into t-shirts, you might want to check books from our publishing house, the Military History Group. If you like well-researched books with footnotes, be sure to check out the links in the description. Now a minor addition, here we have a T-72M, which is equipped with a KMT-8, which is a partial anti-mining system, you could say, that is specifically or made only to protect the tank itself. So here 
these would be deployed and basically keep mines away from the tracks of the tank. The problem is any tank that follows up has to definitely follow the track of the tank, of the leading tank, else it does not really help. Well, it's because, well, there might be still mines there. Now, these things here are basically made to um, detonate tilt rod mines. So these are mines that have a rod out and basically, so because it doesn't touch the ground here, they might click off and detonate. So basically these are, were, done, were heavily used before magnetic mines were a thing. Because, well, a magnetic mine also a contact, so not a contact fuse, but these were basically sticking out of the ground and then they could be, with this mechanism basically, they could be detonated before. There are also some, some vehicles that have a, a, magnetic, a, a magnetic system in there to also detonate these mines. Now I have, I heard some people told me that this in front is actually such a system, but another person told me it's not. So I'm not entirely sure if this is such a system or not. So this is basically specifically for one tank. Of course, if you have a tank platoon or even a company, they can all follow the lead tank. But the issue is once the lead tank gets hit, everyone else has to drive back in the same lane. And so you see the limited use of this. Of course, it's way cheaper than a mine clearing tank and you use several of these. So it can to a certain degree work, but it's definitely not what you consider a mine clearing tank. But when it comes to modern mines on the battlefield, there's something else we need to not forget about. Now, when I think about mines, I generally think about guys digging in mines that they're below the glass, uh, the, the grass surface or something or, or in the field. So, so basically, there's a lot of time was invested by combat engineers to deploy them and prepare them and everything else. And they're in, the, in, in, in front of defensive positions and error of denied and everything about that. But nowadays, we have deployable mines, like the remote anti-armor mine system, which is, from, which is in use by the US and Ukrainian forces. But the, the Soviet or Russian systems, we have the PTM-1, 3 and 4. So these mines can be deployed by artillery, rocket artillery and helicopter. So you can basically, you have your instant minefield. This, of course, I mean, these mines are not dug in, so they are more visible, but still you have to kind of clear or get rid of them. And as the combat engineer that serves in Ukraine mentioned a few times, like what they do, like the Russians, for instance, they fire their mines on a crossroad. Basically, when they assume that there might be coming an offensive up or something else, they just, or, or when they're retreating, okay, let's put all the mine or let's put some mines on a crossroad. And then, well, you have an important part in the terrain which you can't use anymore safely. So this is another aspect why mines nowadays are way more problematic than like the second world war, because the second world war you just couldn't drop a bunch of mines and, and clear off an area. It took time and effort. Nowadays, it's, it can be done rather fast. And this is rarely something you see in the news or somewhere else. How should I put it? It's not intuitive that I think of, of air or artillery deployable mines. Now, an interesting aspect here is about the combat engineer actually noted, I asked him, okay, what is more common, the PTM-1, the PTM-3, or the PTM-4? And he noted that in his experience, some are more prevalent in the east and some are more prevalent in the south. And he suspects it's mainly a logistical issue, so that, that it seems that for, for one front, they are mostly supplied with one kind of mine, and the other front is supplied mostly with another mine. Although this is his personal experience, so this might be just a coincidence. So why are mines such a major problem for offensives? First off, to clear a minefield, you need substantial resources. You can bring your mine clearing tanks, but as you pointed out, they are very slow, they are very visible, and they are very big, juicy targets. So you have to suppress every enemy tank-defeating weapon, basically, where these vehicles are used and 
this can be quite a challenging task. At the same time, these only clear a minor area, so they clear a path for the tanks, but your infantry might have trouble following, and as you all know, tanks without infantry are also very vulnerable as well. So it's not like that's the perfect solution. You still might need combat engineers to clear out more of the minefields or to help also, in this case, clear off the vehicle, the mines of the vehicle, which is not that important for the offensive at hand, but still not an issue. Then the other thing is, of course, air and artillery deployable mines that can, be, can seal off certain areas rather fast or instantaneously, which creates a huge new problem as well. As such, this is why mines are such a major problem and something that is rarely discussed. I hope you learned something new. Big thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting me. Thank you for watching and see you next time.